Good morning. We come in our daily Bible reading to Matthew chapter 25. And what we're going to find here in the 25th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew are three different examples of what it means to please the Master. Now, as you consider Matthew chapter 24 and the destruction of Jerusalem being specified by Jesus to some extent, we recognize a bit of a shift perhaps near the end of that chapter or even into chapter 25, where we talk not just about the destruction of Jerusalem and being ready for that day to come, but being ready for the judgment. So as we pick up in Matthew chapter 25, let's recognize that we have judgment awaiting us and we need to be ready for when our master comes back. Read with me in Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse one. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Verse 13 is critical to the understanding of this first section in Matthew 25. The idea that God is going to end the world on his terms. That we are going to answer for our life on terms that are not our own. We don't know when we're going to die on an individual basis, and we certainly don't know when God is going to come again and destroy the world with fire. And so what does that do for us? Well, it should make us cognizant, number one, of God's power and strength, but also number two, it should make sure that we spend every moment taking it captive for the cause of Jesus Christ. And what does that look like? Well, that means a lot of sacrifice. When you consider the words of verse 12, truly I say to you, I do not know you, it conjures to my mind at least Matthew chapter 7. In verse 21, when Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is heaven will enter. And in verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, have I not done many miracles, many signs in your name? And what does he say to them? Depart from me. I never knew you. If you think about Matthew 7, 21 through 23, it's clear that God expects us to submit to Jesus. And on a day-to-day -day basis, that can be hard because what happens is we kind of live and we go through our day and it kind of feels like this world is our home. And we can say and we can sing, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. We can know that. But unless we tangibly feel, unless we include that in our prayers, we incorporate that in our thoughts, we maybe leave that on messages around the house and the car, it can be easy to slip into this pattern. Think about this in verse 2. There were five foolish and five wise. What distinguished the wise from the foolish? Well, obviously it was those who were ready. But notice verse 4 specifically, the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. And so in verse 5, when the bridegroom was delayed, the wise were the only ones who were ready still. It's not that the foolish were terrible people, although you can make the analogy that we need to please God and God defines what is good. And so good people are those who are wise and do what God says. But it's that they were unprepared for the coming. It's easy to push things off for another day to say, hey, tomorrow I'm going to get better at that. Next week I'm going to get better at that. Next year it's going to be my New Year's resolution. But we need to know that each and every day we need to take that day captive and serve Jesus to the best of our abilities by loving God and serving others. In verse 14, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To the one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He who had also received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. 
You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, this section has so many lessons that we can take from it. But for the purpose of our daily Bible reading, let's highlight just a few. One of them is to think about the idea of a master and servant relationship. Here you have the master who is entrusting what become servants, essentially. In verse 14, they're described even as servants, pieces of his property. So they aren't just servants in the sense of living out to serve the master and just having no benefits. In fact, they have what the master gave. They are more than that. They are stewards of what the master has given them. Now, that word steward is so important because when we think about an employee or a servant, we think about someone who just does a job and goes home. And there's a sense in which that is part of our job here, to be proper stewards of God's blessing, and we want to return home to be with him. But more than that, a steward is someone who is watching out for something that isn't their own. Have you ever left town and had someone kind of house sit for you or take care of your dogs or your cats or maybe even babysit your children for a night or two? You would want them to take absolute care and consideration and concern for your stuff, for your family, for your animals. Consider also, have you ever borrowed someone's car? If you want to think about trying to have caution and being careful, borrow someone's car. You drive that as safely as imaginable. Why? Well, because it's not yours and you have to return it. One of the keys in the parable of the talents is knowing that we are stewards and that we are going to give an account for what we have done with what God has blessed us with. Now, another point here is in verse 16 beginning, you have someone with five talents and in verse 17, two talents and in verse 18, one talent. And so what we recognize is these talents, this instrument of money here in Matthew 25, shows a different range of ability, and we might even say trust. And as we consider that, we need to realize once again in the Old and New Testament alike, God knows his people. Things are not equal from the sense of we all have the same exact opportunity. That's just not true. That's not what picture the Bible paints. For example, Moses was held to a very high standard as a leader of the children of Israel in a way that so many members of his following would not have been. Elders and teachers are held to a higher standard. James 3 makes it very clear that teachers are held to a stricter judgment. Why? Because they should know the law. In fact, they're even teaching the law so they have an impact on those who are listening. And so we recognize that all things are not equal in the sense not of God judging and caring for people. He absolutely does care for us all in the sense of our opportunities being different. And so whether we think about talents as the instrument of money that's probably being used here in 25, or in the term that we would use it more commonly in talents in terms of abilities to do this or that, recognize we all have different levels. And sometimes we meet people who think they're a five-talent person and they're really more of a two-talent person. But I think a lot of Christians sometimes, because we are humble and striving to be humble like Jesus, we look at ourselves and we actually are five-talent people in the eyes of God, and we view ourselves as a one- or two-talent individual, and that's a problem. Because when I view myself as a one or two talent individual, instead of a five talent person, I'm not going to give God the return on investment that he expects. I'm not going to be a proper steward of his if I'm willing to just bury something in the ground or limit myself in a way that my God has not limited me. What does that look like? Well, it might mean that I don't take chances to evangelize. I don't take opportunities to pray with someone, to be a friend who calls, to be a friend who gives a hug. I don't do what I can do because I just don't think it's required of me because after all, I'm not special. I'm not, I'm not good enough. I'm not like a Moses or Paul. I think if we talked to Moses or Paul, we would see even in their stories and certainly Moses in Exodus 3 and 4. He didn't think that he was worthy of that role. And yet with God's strength, he was. We need to make sure that we do the best that we can do and let God sort out what kind of person we are. And we just do the best we can as stewards of what he's given us. And so, of course, the, the point that jumps off the page is in verse 20. When the five talent man produces five talents more, what does the master say in response in verse 21? Good and faithful servant, you have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Now keep in mind, even the five talent man who has five talents compared to the two and one is told you've been faithful over a little. Because in God's eyes, what we do isn't the whole picture at all. But he is rewarded for his faithful stewardship. And then also the man with two talents in verse 23, the same answer. Good and faithful servant, you have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter in the joy of your master. So the master is good. He expects this return and he gets it. But what about the one talent man? Well, the one talent man has dug a hole and he returns the one talent, but there is no other duplicate. There is no second talent. 
right? The five talent man produced five more. The two talent man, two, two talents more. This man just returned the one. What was the master's response to this? It's interesting in verse 26, you wicked and slothful servant. What's going to happen? Well, in verse 28, the talent will be taken from him. And in verse 30, the worthless servant will be cast into the outer darkness in the place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What does Jesus teach us? Having a proper view of self and being a good steward is not just a good Christian idea or thought process. It's a mandatory exercise in submission to our king. There is punishment awaiting for us if we don't put him first. So please today, take stock of all of your opportunities. Let's take stock of what we can do for others, how I can serve you, how you can serve me and so many others. And make sure we take advantage of that opportunity, our good stewards of God's will. Verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he'll say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty? or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And so we think about this scene, and it's obviously a scene depicting what? A scene in a depiction of the judgment. And Jesus is going to separate those who are faithful on the right from those who are unfaithful on the left. And what is that distinguishing characteristic? Well, certainly it's heaven and hell, we might say, eternal reward, eternal life versus eternal punishment. However, the question is not what is on the other side. We'll talk about that as we conclude the video. But how does someone get onto either side? Well, Jesus sorts them. There is a judgment that we need to be prepared for. But what is the difference? Well, those on the right in verse 35, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. And notice the response of those on the right to saying from Jesus that, he, that they took care of him. Verse 37, they say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And what was that answer in verse 40? Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these of my brothers, you did it to me. Part of this parable of talents, part of this being prepared for the coming of the day of the Lord, the coming of judgment, is to recognize that we need to be looking around. We need to see that there are needs everywhere. And it's my obligation to take care of them. A lot of times we spend time focusing on what can the local church do? And that's a valuable study. It's an important part of our work as Christians that we serve in a local church and we help each other. And even the church as a collective can do this and that as God has ordained. But we also need to realize that sometimes when the local church is overburdened, or we might say trying to do things that shouldn't, we recognize really there are some obligations for the individual to be taking up. And as we think about an individual service, it is taking care of these needs of non-Christians and perhaps whether Christian or non-Christian, the people on the right hand, the people who are going into eternal life, saw that there were needs among the world. And they didn't distinguish, well, is this person good enough for me to help? Is this person mean enough for me to help? They just saw a need and they filled it. Here's a question for me. I gotta step on my own toes here. Am I doing a good job at serving the needs of others? Do I look around? Do I look for opportunities to serve and then fulfill them? Or do I kind of stick my head in the sand and say, well, I don't see any problems here. We need to be looking and we need to be serving. Of course, what's the problem on the other side? Well, th these were people who are told by Jesus, you didn't give me what I need. And their question is similar in verse 44. Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And Jesus' answer again is similar. Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Jesus cares about his creation. He cares about his people. And as we consider serving him, we need to make sure we always put him first and put him first even by serving others, loving our neighbor as ourself. You want to end on verse 46, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Sometimes there's groups of people that say that hell is not real, but heaven is. And it's a problem because Jesus links the idea of eternal life with the idea of eternal punishment. If one is real, the other is as well. It's very clear that they're both on the table. So we need to make sure that we know the stakes are high. 
that God expects us to be a steward. He expects us to be a ready and willing servant of him and his causes, which includes taking care of our fellow man. Hope you join us on Monday as we study Matthew chapter 26 and learn from the great example of Jesus. What do we do when people aren't just in need, but when people are actually persecuting us? What are some of the last commands of Jesus? What do we learn from our Savior who's going to lay down his life for the sheep? Hope you join us on Monday as we study Matthew 26.